The other thing is to look at nuclear instead of looking at it as like, oh, well, we can put up with it, you know, I guess it's not as risky as I thought. It's really a beautiful source of abundance, and we should remember that. It's really abundant. It's the, the nuclear material that we have on this earth was made in dying stars billions of years ago and captures the energy of those stars. Just because the facts are A, if the narrative is B and everyone believes the narrative, then B is what matters. But it's our job in our industry to speak up proudly, soberly, and to engage people in this dialogue. Those two and a half billion people that are in energy poverty, they need us. America cannot meet this threat alone. If there is a single country, of course the world cannot meet it without America, that is willing to, but we're going to need you, the next generation, to finish the job. Nuclear regulation. We need scientists to design new fuels. To focus on net public benefit. We need engineers to invent new technologies. We Over need absurd levels of radiation. Production. Entrepreneurs to sell those technologies. Then we will march towards this. We need workers to operate assembly lines that hum with high tech zero carbon we have components. Unlimited prosperity for all humans. We need diplomats and businessmen and women and Peace Corps volunteers to help developing nations skip past the dirty phase of development and transition to sustainable sources of energy. In other words, we need you. Okay, welcome to another episode of the Fire to Fission podcast, where we talk about energy-dense fuels and how they can better human lives. My name is Mark Heineman, and I'm joined today by Meredith Engwin, author of Shorting the Grid and an energy expert on this topic. Meredith, how are you doing? Thank you. Fine, thank you. I'm doing fine. It's uh, nice to be here on your yeah. podcast. I I'm honored actually to have you on. I mean, you've, you've been on Robert Bryce's podcast four or five times, one of the top yeah. guests, and <laughs> I've really enjoyed listening to you and topics that you've become an expert on. I'm excited to learn from you today. So Meredith, for the audience, why don't you give a brief introduction to yourself, kind of 30 to 60 seconds or elevator pitch, and then we can dive into some of your background. Okay, I am a physical chemist. I have a master's degree in physical chemistry plus some work toward the PhD. After that, I went to work mostly for the utilities on corrosion control and pollution control. And I ended up being one of the first women project managers at the Electric Car Research Institute. Later, I semi-retired to Vermont and I got involved in defending the Vermont Yankee uh, power plant, which unfortunately did shut down, but not because I, I, I and a bunch of friends didn't try to keep it open. And after that, I was writing a blog about Vermont Yankee, which led me to interest in the grid and, and how Vermont Yankee interacted with the grid. And basically, that's how I ended up writing a book about the grid. My background is chemistry, not grid maintenance or anything like that. Got it. And your book, Shorting the Grid, that came out, what, a couple of years ago, 2020? It came out, and yeah, it's three years ago in October. It, it seems like it's flown by. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I really loved it. But before we dive into it, the Vermont Yankee, that, was that a nuclear power plant, gas plant? It was a nuclear power plant, the only one in Vermont. It made 70% of the electricity that was made in Vermont. And the governor of Vermont basically had political reasons why he could get more supporters if he said he was going to shut that plant down, and it ended up being shut down. And I wrote a blog newspapers were very prejudiced against Vermont Yankee. They, they, they had a hard time saying anything went well there, but if there was the tiniest glitch, it was on the front page. So at any rate, I began writing a blog about Vermont Yankee, and one of the people who was reading the blog said, I noticed that you're writing a, a little about the grid. And I said, yeah. And he said, well, have you thought of joining the consumer liaison group for our grid operator? And I said, I didn't know our grid operator had a consumer liaison group. Anyway, I joined it. And that's when I began uh, really understanding the grid through sort of an immersion. <laughs> <laughs> How long did it take you to move from novice to expert on the grid? 
Well, I really can't say. I think that I would say that I, be, I began as a novice, maybe in uh, 2010 when I began my blog, and every now and again I'd have to talk about Vermont Yankee and how it interacted with the grid. And then 2014 to 2018, I was on the coordinating council of the Consumer Liaison Group, and that gave me a sort of semi-insider's view of the grid and introduced me to people who were very knowledgeable about the grid. So I would say that from 2014 to 2020, when I wrote the book, was my most intense study of the grid, but I had really been studying it before from 2010 to 2014. Yeah. I, and the grid can be such an abstract idea. <laughs> it's, it's this much more complicated, like, series of wires and channels and switches and generation and I mean, a lot of people just say, well, it's it's our outlets and it's where our power comes from. But it, it's fascinating to me. I feel like the more I learn about it, the less I understand it. Well, that keeps happening. I'm, I'm sorry to say that it keeps happening. And, and it happens to me also. Uh, and one of the things I, I decided not to beat myself up about the fact I didn't understand all of it, because when I was asking questions, for example, I, I, I got to know a fair number of people at the uh, grid operator, ISO New England, and I'd call one of them up and I'd say, look, can you help me understand this? And I'd ask my question, and sometimes they'd answer it, and sometimes they'd say, oh, Meredith, that's kind of an operations question, and I'm more in the regulatory area. Or, Meredith, that's more of a, a dispatch question, and I'm over in the operation. I mean, yeah. you know, there are all these subsets. The people inside may not even understand all of it. <laughs> no, they don't. I mean, I don't mean that in a bad way. If, if It's just that the situation has become so complicated that I don't think that people can understand it except as an overview. And there's always some kind of gotcha where you think you understood it and then you discover, oh, look at that, you know, and it's very annoying. Yeah. So you cover a lot of that in your book, Shorting the Grid, which I recommend everyone grab a copy of, go read it. It's fascinating. Um, yes, but I'm going be... to just show it right now because that's the kind of thing I do. <laughs> nice. Okay. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> What drove you to write it? And then, yeah, what are one or two of these kind of more complex technical issues that you have to explain to folks more often? Okay. What drove Those me are two to big write questions, it, so take your time. <laughs> okay. What drove me to write it was that as I was learning so much with the consumer liaison group and so forth, I, I found it was difficult to explain it to people because everything I said seemed to have a backstory. <laughs> Unlike, for example, if someone said to you, there was a small tritium, a tritium leak at the nuclear plant, we've got to do something about it. I'm, I might be able to say, look, the if you drank the water with the tritium in it, and you drank two liters a day, you would get far less radioactivity within you than eating half a banana. You know, I could make it simple, okay? Bananas happen to be naturally radioactive to some extent, but the, the, it'd be really hard to hurt yourself by eating them. And at any rate, so, but when I began to try to explain the grid, I was like, I began to sound like one of the people who I asked questions of. No, you see, that's actually a question that the PUC has to answer, not the RT, RTO or something like that. And one of the problems is that there are many, many, many layers of regulation and different groups regulating on the grid. And it, when I read the book, The Big Short, I realized that the same thing was happening there, that, that nobody really could understand all the different financial mechanisms and, and products and rules that were going on about the big short. I mean, be, the idea that a bank will lend money for a homeowner to buy uh, a, um, a house and that that 
mortgage will be packaged with a bunch of other mortgages for ease of, of administration. Those are easy ideas. But what actually was going on with the collateralized debt obligations and trading and all kind and layers and layers of things, it got to the point where the bank you in the old, you know, simple mechanic view of, of getting a mortgage you needed to have a down payment and a good credit record and some earnings. And then the mortgage was both valuable to you and valuable to the bank because you had a very high chance of repaying it. But as things got more complicated, liar's loans, that is loans through the blank, bank didn't check anything. It didn't check that you, you had a job, didn't check that you, you lived where you said you lived. Those were as valuable to the bank as the best mortgage of two cardiac surgeons who happened to be married to each other. You know, I mean, <laughs> it was so I felt that things were getting very things. Were, and and the, the book, The Big Short, really showed me how that kind of thing can perpetuate itself. And it occurred to me that what was happening on the grid was the same thing, that what was valuable to investors or whatever wasn't something that made kilowatt hours for the grid and necessarily. So I think, I don't know if it's a chapter or a subchapter in my book, I'd have to look it up, but I have a section in the book called Making Kilowatt Hours is a Fool's Way to Run Your Company, because the, the kilowatt hours are not how you get paid. Everybody's looking for subsidies and for, you know, complex rules of, of, about capacity payments. And that's where all the excitement is. And just churning out kilowatt hours, I mean, it, it isn't valued. But of course, it's what the grid needs. I mean, as somebody who turns on my lights, I want that grid to be turning out kilowatt hours very reliably and very fairly inexpensively. But if you look at how the grid is governed, reliable and inexpensive is not, not part of the big thing. I mean, the big thing is much more complex. And there's an old phrase about that, and you, I'm sure you know it. If you, if you can't blind them with brilliance, baffle them with bull droppings. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's wonderful. And I must say that this is this is what happens a lot. You know, you might think, oh, I can't understand the grid. Well, that's because they're they've built so many systems that it's meant to be baffling. There's another book about the grid, which is not totally my my favorite, but it's called Short Circuiting Policy by a, a, a Leah Potts. And, and no, Leah, I'm forgetting, Leah Stokes. And at any rate, one of the things she says in the book, which I, I really agree with, is the fog of enactment. That is, people are passing laws that are so complicated that you really don't know what the consequences are going to be about electricity. Some of them you can figure it out and it's not good, but some of them, it's just like, huh? W w w wait a minute. Oh, okay, you mean if this and that, but not that. You know, th that's what she calls the fog of enactment. Is that because some of these lawmakers understand them themselves or why, why does that happen? Well, the lawmaker has an incentive to understand it. But the lawmaker has to be, I mean, I don't know how they can do it. They, they have to be experts on everything. I mean, you know, the lawmaker may have to decide on land use problems in at the edges of the national forest in, on, in his state. He may have to decide, I mean, there, there yeah. can be debates on, on the appropriate uh, hunting season. There can be debates on what kind of changes to riverbanks are allowed or how far back houses have to be from. I mean, and, and then of course there's electricity and then there's, then there's unemployment payments and how they get allocated. And, so what I'm saying is that the lawmakers have a really full plate. And in the halls of Congress, they tend to have a staff. But in the state legislature, not so much a staff. I mean, the ones I've seen, 
the a committee like for example the energy and environment committee environmental committee will have one assigned clerk to it and may have eight committee members well there are another committees with another assigned clerk but this is not huge backup yeah yeah there's not a lot of resources at the state level to really study these things and get super educated on them yeah yeah Okay, so I, I liked your analogy to the big short and how we're not valuing things correctly. You know, it seems like something that was taken for granted for a long time with the grid was that, oh, energy generation sources are just reliable, and so they'll, they'll just work. They'll work when we turn the lights on. And they didn't have to value reliability as much as perhaps we have to value it now. Um, additionally, you know, just last night, there was a member of the Colorado Energy Office that said very confidently and with, with great gusto that renewables are the cheapest source of energy available to utilities to build. Is that true? If not, why not? No. I mean, the short answer is no, but go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't well, want to be beating around the bush about this. <laughs> yeah, renewables are not the cheapest, right? So tell us why. Well, well the, the thing is that renewables are the cheapest comes from a very narrow look at what's going on. And that narrow look is typical nowadays because we don't have vertically integrated utilities that are responsible for the power plant and the, and the transmission and then uh, sending it to your house distribution. And nowadays, the, the different uh, merchant plants compete with each other in auctions. They also can get power purchase agreements, but those are often secret, and, and, and so it's, it's easier to write a book about the auctions because they're visible, and, and, and they actually do make a lot of difference. But I, I guess what I'm saying is that there's, if you look at the auction, and you, you can say, well, the wind turbine is bidding in at zero cents per kilowatt hour while that nuclear plant is building it, bidding in at four cents and, and the uh, gas plant is bidding in at seven cents. So the, obviously the wind turbine's the cheapest thing on the grid, but that isn't completely the case because the nuclear plant and the gas plant can be turned on and off to meet the, the requirements of the grid and the, the wind turbine can be turned off, but it can't be turned on, not by humans. And, you know, the wind has to blow. So what happens is, uh, and I, I went into some studies about this, and you have to look at not just the cost to make the next kilowatt hour of electricity with a wind turbine or whatever. You have to look at the system cost to the grid. And is it the way the grid is managed in, in the days before there were a lot of wind turbines, the idea is that you you had a, you looked at what the highest demand on the grid was. You added 10% to that. Then you said, okay, we have to have enough power plants to be supply the highest demand on the grid plus 10% or maybe to plus 15%, so that if a power plant is offline or it's having problems, we still have enough on the grid. And then each power plant shouldn't be more than 10% of the, the grid because we don't want to have, you know, we've got this 10% margin of safety, and what if one of the power plants is 30% and that's the one that goes down? So, you know, so there were these rules and they, they worked very well to keep the grid reliable. Unfortunately, you can guess that the wind turbine is not going to be available a lot of the time. And so the wind turbine, if the wind turbine is one megawatt, I've seen studies about this, it has to have about one megawatt of fast acting resources in the background so that the wind dies down and the other one goes on quickly. You know, now you can say that means the wind turbine is useless. Well, it isn't useless because it's, let's say they're fast acting resources, a gas a fire plant, and you don't want to use a lot of gas. And you can say, well, the wind turbine saved me the gas while it was available. Okay. But when you get right down to it, you're going to have to build two objects, each of which is capable of one megawatt hour or, you know, output in order to have the equivalent of 
uh, one object if it was just the, the gas turbine. Yeah. And so that becomes very expensive, and that's part of the system cost to the grid. And then if you begin looking at, and, and, and this really annoys me, but people will say, well, we can have 100% if we have batteries. Now, I don't go for that because uh, we really don't have that kind of battery yet, but you know, things could happen, we could have them. But let's look at that for a moment. Let's look at this wind turbine, and it can produce, say, one megawatt at a time, and it contributes to what the grid has to have when it needs a lot of, of power. Okay. Now you say, well, you can charge a battery with it. Not while it's providing power to the grid. It's only one megawatt. So you have to build another wind turbine next to it to be charging up the battery while the wind is blowing strong and the, and the, and the wind turbine is providing to the grid. And so yeah. now, what have you got here? You've got three different systems. You've got your first wind turbine, your second wind turbine, and your battery. Yeah. So that's the kind of thing that makes it, makes it saying, well, the marginal cost of the next kilowatt hour from that wind turbine is zero. It's sort of like, yeah, and if you put enough of them on the grid, everybody's going to go broke. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that was very well said you're able to articulate it much more succinctly than me. I, I, well, I often I, struggle I, with this, but it's, I mean, it's really, yeah, you got to overbuild, right? Like you have to build more than is required and that reduces the efficacy or the efficiency of the capital deployed. That's right. The capital becomes less efficiently utilized. The rate payers still have to pay for the capital, whether it's efficiently utilized or not, because, you know, I, I want to highlight that point a little bit, which this, this is one of the things that upsets me the most is there feels like there's a perverse incentive in grid operators and utilities that they get compensated based on how much capital they deploy. So if suddenly we're giving them the authority to write blank checks to build overbuild, then they make more money. Well, that's the way it used to be and is still some places. But basically, what you're talking about is cost of service agreements, which is how the grid used to run before the auctions were put in. And that's actually why the, one of the reasons the auctions were put in. People were saying, oh, we are getting a really gold-plated grid here because the way for the owner of this power plant to make more money or this utility is to spend more money so that they get a higher rate of return on their capital investment. In Probably other the words, same, they, same rate of return, but more the dollars. Same rate of return, the but more, yeah. In other words, it's the difference between 8% of a million dollars and 8% of $2 million. So yeah. the rate of return hasn't changed, but the money in your pocket has changed. Exactly. <laughs> or the money taken out of the, the rate payers has changed. So people were really concerned that it was gold-plated, and that's why they wanted auctions where supposedly the very least expensive power plant would be the most likely to be deployed, and nobody got paid extra because they, they had just built something. So you built it. Good. I hope you can make some money. You know, that sort of thing as opposed to, you know, now that you've spent $2 million, you've got another 8% rate of return on those $2 million. Aren't you happy? Yeah. But unfortunately, there is no perfect way to run a grid. And the business of not giving the power plants some security of how much they will be able to make has led to a lot of uh, complicated rules on the grid. And it has provided a lot of work for lawyers. So if you really want, uh, you know, I think that this was the, I, sometimes I look at the RTOs and I think, what a gift to the legal profession. So That's, uh, that's a tough one for me. My partner is a lawyer and she... Well, my aunt is a lawyer. God, There's nothing wrong him. with lawyers. <laughs> the only thing is that if you find you're paying more, more to lawyers than to engineers, that's a difficult way to run a grid. Well, it's, it's less, it's truly from an energy perspective, less productive, right? Yes. I mean, you're going to have less, it's going to be less efficient and it's going to cost more. So, 
Well, I um, don't mean to knock l lawyers too much. I'm just saying that it oh, is. Oh, I'll, I'll knock them all day. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm just trying to explain that when the rules get too complicated, then there's an awful lot of time writing white papers and briefs and, and appeals to FERC and FERC answers and FERC orders and uh, appeals to the FERC orders and it just So do you maybe on. have an example of, of a complicated rule or oh, a sure. way to characterize I, I, this? I, I, no, I'm, I'm happy to, totally happy yeah. to. Okay, the first thing we have to say is, uh, is that not all power plants can make it just by making kilowatt hours. And, and I said that before. One of the problems is that the amount of energy used during the day varies so that people are using a lot of energy at dinner time and not so much at two in the morning. And so you have to have power plants that are there for you at dinner time but are turned off at two in the morning. That's how the grid works. Okay, what about that power plant that is turned off at two in the morning? In the old days with the gold-plated grid, it was still getting its rate of return and it still had money to keep itself ready to run. But in the new day where it has to be paid on uh, as it's used, you know, it, it, when it wins the chance to get on the grid during the auction, then it's offline a lot and it isn't getting a lot of payment. And so there was quite a bit of concern, and quite rightly, that a lot of the power plants that don't run 24-7 would just disappear from the grid. They wouldn't be able to make it, bye-bye. And then all of a sudden, when, when people came home for dinner, who was gonna, who, who, who are they gonna call? You know, those plants wouldn't be there anymore. So what they came up with is what's called a capacity payment. And the capacity payment is separate from the energy payment. Not all areas have capacity payments, but that's another story. Let's assume we're in an area with a capacity payment. So the idea is that the, the power plant gets paid per kilowatt hour when it's operating, and it also gets paid per kilowatt installed just for being there, okay? And so it, it has a capacity payment, the I'm here and I'm installed and I'm here, and it also has an energy payment. Well, this has turned into a lot of fun because what happens is that here's a power plant, say, and it gets its capacity payment and the grid is very stressed and the grid operator says, it's your turn, you gotta get on. And it says, oh, Sorry, but the dog ate my uh, lunch. I can't get on. So what do you do about this? So the grid operators have made all sorts of rules, some of which they put in place and then they're overturned by FERC as not being appropriate and others they put in place. So for example, uh, there's an inventoried energy rule in our in our uh, area, and in our grid operator. Inventoried energy means that they will pay the power plant so much per day for the, um, if it has a, a, a full day's uh, fuel stored on site. So that's great for the uh, gas plants and, well, they, they have a hard time, they will store oil rather than gas and oil plants and so forth. But then they decided, well, you know, we don't want to waste the ratepayers' money. So even though coal plants and nuclear plants have a lot of fuel stored on site ordinarily, we're not going to pay them for their fuel stored on site because after all they would pay. But of course you understand that if you pay one kind of plant and you don't pay the other kind of plant for the same outcome, you're really being prejudiced against the one kind of plant. So, okay, so that's what I mean by it's a lot of fun, that sort of thing. Uh, how do you get the plants to be available with fuel when the grid is stressed? Okay, that's one thing. Here's another one from the same question. So the, the, the wind turbine doesn't just get paid its capacity payment and its energy payment. It also gets subsidies, such as the production tax credit, and it can sell a renewable energy certificate or credit. Every time it makes a kilowatt hour, it can sell that certificate for that kilowatt hour to a utility 
who needs to have, quote, renewable on their grid. The, the utility doesn't have to buy its kilowatt hour. It can just buy its rec. So the thing is, the grid is paying for the kilowatt hour, and the utilities are swapping these recs and sending money to the power plant. So that means that these power plants that are like a wind turbine can bid in at zero cents per kilowatt hour because their their expenses are being covered by the production tax credit and the rec, and uh, they can bid in at minus two cents per kilowatt hour. Okay, so at that point. They're, they're bidding in very low in the energy markets, and nothing's being done about that. But they're bidding in very low in the capacity markets, and all of a sudden there's a lot of trouble. Because if you remember, a gas fire plant that's only there when there's a high demand on the grid, it depends on its capacity payments. So if there's all these wind turbines bidding in very low, the capacity clearing price goes down and uh, all of a sudden you don't have enough capacity payments to keep the the gas fire plants going at which point you ha- they came up in our area they came up with a MOPR minimum offer price rule which means that the the wind turbines and other such uh power plants that have substantial subsidies are not allowed to consider their subsidies when building bidding in so the wind turbine may be actually costing two three cents per, per kilowatt hour to run it and and have the you know the oil there and the people who will take care of it the oil for the gears and stuff and the people who will take care of it and people inspecting it every now and again and okay so you have your wind turbine let's say it takes two cents but actually it, it it's bidding in at zero because it gets subsidies which more than make up for the two cents well the other plants that depend on those capacity payments like whoa 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 i mean i you know i they get subsidies. That isn't, uh, they're not actually the cheapest thing on the grid. They're just getting subsidized. Anyway, so you put this MOPR in place, the minimum offer price rule, the wind turbine has to bid in at three cents <coughs> or whatever, not counting its subsidies. Okay, the wind turbine is bidding in considering its subsidies, and then the MOPA rule says, no, you have to bid in as if you didn't get any subsidies, at which point the wind turbine says, you're just trying to put me out of business. Meanwhile, the gas plants are saying, if it can bid in with the subsidy, it's putting me out of business. And there's a lot of fun about this. And so pretty soon the FERC says you can bid in with the MOPA rules can only last for two years or whatever. And then uh, so, but if you try and explain to somebody what the MOPA rules are, all people have heard about them is that they're going to kill the renewables. And if you begin saying, well, let me explain about capacities and about the gas turbines and the fact you need a gas turbine to back up the wind turbine, but if it can't make it, it won't be there. And, and yeah. you see what I'm saying? It, it, Absolutely. It, and actually, I, I didn't get to the next phase, and I'm not going to. But basically, at one point, <clears throat> the idea would be that there would be two capacity auctions, and one capacity auction would only be for plants that got subsidies and so their clearing price would be very low but the other plants would still have a high clearing price and then somehow or other the, these would both be on the grid yeah so I, I think that those two examples were a great way to demonstrate this is complicated and it's it's not an easy problem to solve and I think a lot of the history demonstrates that most grid operators and utilities have tried to approach this fairly and utilize multiple different technologies to sell the same kind of service, but it's it's complex. So um, for listeners, other than uh, your book, which again, we recommend they go out and buy, how do people learn about this? What are some of the best sources of material content that they can read about and, and learn more about? How do people understand, understand it better? <coughs> well, I would say that some of the best content out there is your RTO will have a website. So for example, you can go to the ISO New England website or the MISO website and you can see a lot. And and it's important to like go the, to your website every day so that you can kind of, and, and, or at least every few days so that you can kind of see the trends. Then there are uh, 
other things which are really good. I don't know if you know Emmett Penny. Um, oh yeah, our mutual and, friend Emmett Penny and his article grid or his uh, newsletter Grid Brief. Yeah, shameless grid plug brief. for him. He's, yes, Grid shame, Brief. Yeah. Is, so, so I guess what if you could do worse than going to your your local grid operator to get an idea of what's going on there, and going to and and subscribing to Grid Brief, which at this point I believe is free uh, every day. There's another one that's just started out. I think it's called Grid Status or Grid IO. I, I don't remember the title. I'm sorry. It's a year old. I should remember the title. And then the other thing is that there's a, a magazine or a newsletter you can get on online called Utility Dive. In other words, diving into the utility industry. And that is also free. When you get away from those, everything begins to get pretty expensive. I subscribe to RTO Insider, but I don't tell people they should subscribe because it's, I mean, I, if you want to, go ahead. It's a great thing. But if you, you know, not everybody is $1,300 a year worth of interested. Right. So, I mean, so I would say that Grid Brief, your local RTO website, Utility Dive, and then lots of excellent podcasts. Robert Bryce has a podcast. I think it, there are there's a, a very cynical substack called Green Leap Forward, which compares the push to be 100% renewables with Mao's Great Leap Forward. It isn't as fierce as that all the time, but that's the basic idea. If you remember, Mao's Great Leap Forward entered in nothing but famine. That's what happened. Well, I'll have to check that out. That's that sounds interesting. And another another one I recommend is Irina Slav. Uh, she has a uh, Substack, which is pretty inexpensive. It's like fifty dollars a year. Uh, most of the Substacks are more. And, and, and Robert Bryce, oh my God, you've got to follow Robert Bryce's Power Hungry podcast and subscribe to him on Substack too. So, I mean, there are a lot of places you can get a lot of information and some of them cost a, a little money, but, but the ones I've named with the exception of um, uh, RTO Insider, they cost, you know, 50 to 80 a year. They don't cost, you know, a thousand a year. So, and you can say, well, I'm just going to go with the free ones. I'm going to go with the Robert Bryce's podcasts and I'm going to go with Emmett Penny's Grid Brief and, you know, and you'll, you'll learn a whole lot. Yeah. I think those are great recommendations. So Meredith, I came up with this question just before our interview, but oh, something no, that's always- a new one. <laughs> <laughs> No, I actually sent it to you, so maybe oh, you yeah, time to think okay. about it, but yeah. Okay. Something that's always fascinated me about the industry is kind of the lack of growth in the utility industry specifically or economic opportunities. So I contrast this against kind of the oil and gas industry where I'm from, where, I mean, it's boom bust. People can go broke, but they can also get rich. And there's kind of this entrepreneurial spirit and it can be very, very vibrant at times. When I contrast that against the utility side of the ener energy industry, it can feel kind of sleepy. And I, I think part of that's due to their guaranteed rate of return, their limited growth opportunity, like, and also it's a regulated monopoly. It's harder for startups and entrepreneurs to enter into it. On the other hand, as we meant, talked about earlier, they are guaranteed a rate of return. So even if they do bad business or they have gold plated facilities. Well, in the integrated uh, areas, they're guaranteed a rate of return. They're not guaranteed a rate of return in the RTO areas. Right. Right. So maybe how about you comment on, well, let's start with describing the difference between RTO and integrated utilities and then comment on, you know, is this an issue, this lack of growth opportunity and wealth generation in, in the utility industry? Is it the best solution? And if not, how, how could we fix it? Well, I think that it, well, the first thing is uh, the RTOs versus the integrated utilities. The easiest thing to say is that when you have a RTO, you have your local distribution utility, and it, it's in charge of distribution and it actually does get a rate of return. And then it buys the electricity from merchant generators that do nothing but make electricity. 
And so one of the, the problems is that where does the buck stop? Uh, if the merchant generators aren't making money, they can just quit. Where in the integrated version, you're supposed to have enough, the PUC is supposed to be sure that there's enough power available for, for people. The other question is really a, a quite an important one and a, and a difficult one, because when you get right down to it, the utility industry is, yeah, there are these auctions and stuff, but when you get right down to it, it is a, a natural monopoly, just like a, a city supplied water. You're not going to have four pipes going to your house for four different water companies and choose the one that uh, that happens to be cheapest at the time. And you're not going to have four wires to your house and choose the electricity company that happens to be cheapest at the time. It's a natural monopoly built around a geographical area. And because of that, it isn't like entrepreneurial. You can't add a geographical area, the best you can do is improve your efficiency and perhaps encourage people to use more of your product, which was, of course, a very big deal uh, until like the, I don't know, 70s or something. I mean, if you think about all the kinds of things that were introduced in the 50s, washing machines, dishwashers, irons, electric stoves, television. I mean, there was growth then. <laughs> Let's put it this way. There was growth then. But I think that that's a, a problem. And I don't know really how it can be solved in the long run, because the utilities, unfortunately, if, if you're an EE major uh, and you could get a job, for example, uh, designing uh, circuits, or at a startup of some kind of electronics thing, or you could go to a utility, you might think, yeah, I could go to a utility and take a nap at my desk for the next couple of years. That isn't exactly how it works, but obviously there's no way to get rich at a utility per se. Um, the one place that there is innovation is with the, uh, the vendors. So, for example, there's a lot of in innovation now in the nuclear area where there are many, many, many startups in, in nuclear energy. Uh, I think that the uh, close call that Europe had last winter when it couldn't get gas or whatever has made everybody think, you know, if we had a nuclear plant here, it would have fuel on site for the whole winter. It'd be really nice. <laughs> I mean, I we I'll... might have problems the following winter if there was an embargo or something, but it wouldn't be this sudden death experience, you know? Yeah. And so the, there's a lot of innovation in the, in the vendor area. And I think that that's where... It, and also, another thing that's very nice about utilities is I think that the people I know who work for utilities... They have a very strong feeling of serving their towns and their areas. I mean, they oh, know yeah. the that sense if, of public service that they have it's a is, public, is immense. It's a central yeah. public service. If the grid went down for the whole United States, there would literally be millions of deaths. And if you want to read something scary, you can always read Ted Koppel's Lights Out. You know, but but don't do, don't read it before bedtime. It's about <laughs> it's about a power grid going down. So anyhow, so there is a feeling of public service, and especially for the people in the distribution and transmissions. Well, everybody. I mean, for Pete's sake, the person running the dispatch center for the power plants, he knows he's he or she knows he's got to, they've got to keep that that demand and and supply very closely balanced in real time or bad things are going to happen and they you know they take it very seriously and there are often several people watching different aspects of it at the same time you know in the control room so there's a feeling of camaraderie between the control room people and also a feeling of we are really helping our uh, our community. Let me tell you about the helping community thing, which is, I think, very funny in a way. The first time I went to a control room, 
and I saw these two big TV monitors up there. And I said, well, do the guys have time to watch TV? No, no, no. If there's a traffic accident or a, or a fire or anything that's disrupting, they have to know about it because it could be very quickly reflected in the electricity demand. And so that's why they have news programs all over the, in, in the uh, dispatcher's control room. Anyway, so I guess, I guess that there are rewards knowing that you're keeping your community safe and so forth. If you think about it, our daughter-in-law is a nurse. You don't get rich being a nurse, but there are other, other rewards, right? I mean, it's paid reasonably, not as well as it should be, but it, it's yeah. paid reasonably and people are appreciative of what you do. You know, what's come to mind when you were describing that is there is a paradigm shift that has happened and is, is evolving that could transform this. So you described, you said, well, it, it's challenging to have entrepreneurship and startups and wealth generation in markets and companies that are dominated by monopolies, which is entirely true, right? But there, there are, with renewables and people putting solar panels on their roofs, there's this attitude that, wow, we can generate distributed power sources. I mean, that's, that's a trend that is developing to not have centralized power sources, but rather distributed. And then you mentioned technology innovation, specifically in nuclear. Something that comes to mind or came to mind while you're describing it was, well, why, didn't, why don't people generate all of their power on site? And historically, it's been because you have to get a fuel to your home or your facility or your building and have, you know, an oil pipeline or a gas pipeline or a coal train go to every single facility is really impractical. But if we had micronuclear reactors at each facility that only needed to be refueled once every five to 10 years, then that could really dramatically shift, even if they're a backup generation source. I mean, there, there's generator, diesel generator sales are um, skyrocketing nationally yes you know I, I know people that are buying them all over the place but you know if you if you could license and build and distribute micro nuclear reactors to every consumer that wanted them or business that wanted them then that could fundamentally shift this idea that power gen is or needs to be a monopoly yes, do you it agree? Could. I, I guess I, that's, I, that, that's the question do you agree it would be better it would be actually better to have the equivalent of community nuclear that is you know for a little area of nuclear i mean there's yeah. a certain amount of overhead in in and even a small plant and and putting uh, enough you know concrete around it and and so forth to, to keep it safe and <clears throat> and so i would tend to say community nuclear but you know in terms of keeping it safe let's look at the fact that as my friend rod adams said that he he spent years sleeping within uh what 100 feet of a nuclear reactor and spending all his time with it i mean because that's what a life on a submarine is like yeah you know so i like um, that though community have it have it be part of your hoa fee Right, rather than every single house builds their own. Yeah, yeah, it'd be better not to have every single house have its own. I want to say one other thing about distributed generation. The thing is that people say, well, solar, it's distributed generation. You know, it's on my roof, it's on your roof. It's We got a big solar field down, down by the interstate or someplace uh, else, you know, that's not uh, an old parking lot, whatever. But it since the sun sets all at the same time, it's really like a huge plant. And and remember, my the rule was that we would have no plant more than 10% in the old days, so that if one plant went down, it wasn't a big deal. So now we've got these duck curves. <coughs> and these duck curves are proving that Distributed generation is actually a mega plant. It just happens to be distributed over an area, but it, it, it goes on and off pretty much simultaneously with itself. Yeah, you know? that's, that's, a, that's a fascinating way to think about it. And it's entirely true, right? So I, I have heard some proponents of it push back and say, well, if we could just interconnect well enough, then, you know, if a cloud goes over the houses in Colorado, but not over the houses in Wyoming, then 
you know, if the wires are just connected far enough, then we can compensate or there'll be enough okay. averages and that's, balances. That's very ambitious. Utopian. <laughs> it's very utopian. It's very hard yeah. to get transmission lines built and people object to them and, and it's hard to get the rights to build them. And furthermore, more, they're expensive and they're vulnerable. I mean, I, I don't like the idea of a transmission line strung across the Rockies. I mean, so the Rockies are pretty fierce weather. I mean, I, I guess it sounds cute, but it really, it, it isn't practical. Yeah. Okay. So you mentioned a book that described rolling blackouts. This was a topic that I wanted to address. There's been some people that think that these could become more common in the future as we add more intermittent sources. Do you, do you mind commenting a little bit more about blackouts or brownouts or the, the reliability issue, perhaps? Okay, I'm going to say that the book I talked about doesn't describe rolling blackouts. It, it describes large blackouts that last for some period of Extended time from, yeah. from a few, a few days to whatever. Uh, the book is uh, by Ted Koppel, and it's called Lights Out. And um, it's about how unprepared we are and what the consequences would be of, of an EMP strike or what's called a Carrington event. Have you ever heard of a Carrington event? I haven't. Okay. Well, the sometime in the 1850s, the sun had a there was a lot of, of material and and electromagnetic being sent out from the sun in, in some kind of huge flare and I think those huge flares have a special name but I don't know the name so in any way it was sent out from the sun uh, nothing we can control about it and in in, in, in that time there was uh, almost no electricity all there was was telegraph lines and they melted and they <clears throat> they had the operators couldn't touch the keys and it was really quite an, a a difficult uh, situation and if you you think about it <clears throat> all there was was the telegraph lines and what would happen now with such an event so you can yeah. look up the Carrington event you can just look it up on wikipedia if you want but uh, people don't know about it. You know, people are, are very like, we want everything to be perfect and so forth and so on. And really, the world has a lot of dangers. And by being smart, we hope to protect ourselves against most of them. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> the role of Black House in Texas in 2021, one of the problems is they didn't roll. They got stuck which is not impossible because you can see they did. And so they were one uh, people were out of power for 48 hours. It was very cold out and uh, I th about 200 people died. Yeah. Okay. So Meredith, we're coming up on our time, but what this is a nuclear podcast and we haven't, we talked a little bit about nuclear, but not a ton. So in, in your view, what's one of the most impactful steps that we as a society can take towards trying to build more nuclear and how can people help? Well, <clears throat> I think as a society, we could, we could begin to put it in context <clears throat> with other things. For example, is nuclear safe? Well, compared to what? C compared to dams, compared to fossil, compared to not having electricity, compared to, I mean, we, we look for some unreasonably high level of safety, which we don't look for in other things. For example, I get on planes all the time and I am aware that planes crash, but I also know that planes have been crashing less and less as we've gotten better and better at it. I mean, when I was in high school, I lost a, a young, I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't, he wasn't my best friend or anything, but he lived on the same block as I did. And his family decided to go down to Florida and uh, their plane crashed. And so, I mean, I'm just trying to tell you that, yeah, planes, that, that wasn't, it was a terrible thing. It wasn't such an unusual thing. Nowadays, it'd be very unusual for a commercial plane to crash. But at any rate, 
we have to look at it in terms of what do we get and what do we risk. And we don't actually risk very much. Uh, people, that would be one of the things. The other thing is to look at nuclear, instead of looking at it as like, oh, well, we can put up with it, you know, I guess it's not as risky as I thought. It's really a beautiful source of abundance. And we should remember that. It's really abundant. It's the, the nuclear material that we have on this earth was made in dying stars billions of years ago and captures the energy of those stars. So there's like, it, it, it's just such a beautiful abundance. And I feel that if we could look at what it could do for us, what it does do for us, and what it could do for us with desalinization of seawater and all kinds of power for, for example, we could grow food uh, in greenhouses because the power would be very inexpensive in cold areas. Anyway, things like that. Yeah, I, I love that. So yeah, so what I heard was normalizing the risk and really the cost benefit in society and trying to highlight more of the benefit than the uh, risk and cost. So yeah. I think that's that's a tremendous approach, very intelligent and, and rational, and it, it's a great story to tell, right? And we should be telling it, so. Okay, well, Meredith, why don't you leave us kind of with uh, your vision of the future? What's the world gonna look like in the next uh, 10 to 20 years and how are we gonna help people get there? Well. For the future, I think what we can do, the first thing we can do is keep all existing nuclear plants that are in reasonable shape, and most of them are, operating and re repair and revitalize some that have been shut down very recently. For example, uh, Palisades may be revitalized, and there are a whole bunch of plants in Germany that uh, were just shut down in the past six months, and they, they could be put back online. Um, <clears throat> And then we should be building nuclear plants. And I think that people say, oh, they're too expensive. But, you know, they're not. We have not. Well, they're very, they can be very expensive. Photo is a very, very bad scene that it got so expensive. But when you get right down to it, even a plant like Vodal will be making very reliable power for decades. And we should yeah. be appreciative Potent of that. Probably and centuries, right? <laughs> it might well be centuries. Somebody, somebody said something to me I thought was very good. It said, well, you know, you can say a nuclear plant's expensive and it takes a while to build. You can say, yeah, a two-story house is expensive and takes a while to build. Let's have tents. We'll all live in tents. No, no, they're not expensive and they don't take very much time to put up, but they have some other drawbacks. And similarly, the, the different things like wind turbines are less expensive, but then they have to have the backup, so they get more expensive, they're less reliable, they're more subject to problems with the weather. And so I, what I would like to see is nuclear plants as baseload plants for the whole world basically, the whole world. And I've been looking at some studies that show that the electricity that's on all the time is about 60% of all the electricity that's produced. <clears throat> and the other 40% is the variable part. So if we had nuclear as baseload, boy, we'd decarbonize hugely. And then we could have some nuclear as load following, some solar as load following, some gas, but substituted by solar when solar is available. I mean, we could have a lot of choices and a low carbon economy and a lot of energy, a lot of electricity, if we could just build nuclear as as the 60% that runs all oh, the time. I love that vision. Let's, let's go do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, Meredith Engwin, this has been wonderful. Thanks so much for chatting with me. Thank you very much.